So one of um, my controversial opinions, or rather opinions that I don't think I have seen a lot of expressed outside of my own head, is that one of the biggest flaws of the Soviet Union was the fact that they had um, this turn to red conservatism and they did not really explore psychology enough. And that is not to say that there weren't great psychologists in uh, the USSR. I did speak about some of the notable psychologists uh, of the USSR, like Vygotsky and his students, and Ilyenkov arguably dabbled in psychology, or well, at least that area of philosophy that he looked into was in close proximity to psychology. And I don't personally think that modern psychology made a lot of breakthroughs in the past 20-30 um, years. Of course, I'm not an expert, but you can see my video titled Why Psychology Bad? Kind of hear more of my thoughts on it. Uh, these are thoughts that are kind of popular in the modern leftist circles. But going back to this opinion of mine that I think that one of the biggest flaws of the USSR was the lack of interest in psychology and the red conservatism is what I'm seeing right now. I'm seeing a lot of people who who were born and raised in the USSR or some of the people my age as well displaying a lot of conservative opinions uh, even though they may be progressive in some areas they actually may say things like well we didn't have a lot of gay people in the USSR it wasn't a thing it is a perversion from the wicked west which I think is a part of the global turn to conservatism just because it has been used in the infamous divide and conquer technique it is being used again we can see a lot of the escalation worldwide in the anti-immigrant sentiments, in the anti-LGBTQ plus sentiments, we see that um, they, the establishment, uh, the people who are bound to keep the status quo and who are bound to keep the power to themselves, they want the people, regular working class people, to feel like there is something that divides us that is so, so deep that we cannot overcome this. And for example, people like me, who may look unusual, are not going to be comrades to the people who, who choose to present themselves a little bit differently. They try their hardest to focus our attention on those little minuscule details like our gender, our orientation, our preferences, and play them out as this gigantic gap between the population which is impossible to breach and that ultimately the fault lies within this one evil group of people you pick whoever immigrants lgbtq plus people uh minorities of any kinds women people of color you name it so they have been using this ever since angela davis's book this one i thought that this conversation was over but apparently not and of course it is absolutely terrifying to see a lot of people who are communists as well believe some of the uh propaganda that that uh, has been used against communists uh, for, for a long time. But I see this as part of the heritage. I talk a lot about all the wonderful and great things that we've inherited from the Soviet Union, and I will keep on talking about them because I think it is so demonized in the West, what happened in the USSR, that we need to do a lot of repair work. However, just as I've always been saying, the USSR was never an ideal, uh, perfect communist place. And I think that not putting enough resources into psychology and studying trauma and studying how people may become prone to certain types of thinking really became a disservice to the Soviet people because, just as I mentioned before, the ideology has slowly but surely shifted towards becoming more conservative. And of course, this is a complicated matter. You cannot uh, simplify it by saying this is how it was. You have to remember that most of the places uh, before the establishment of the Soviet governments most of the places were lacking in all kinds of resources, educational resources. Uh, there was no industrialization. Like here in these lands, we did not have cities. We did not have centralized electricity. We did not have access to clean water oftentimes. So a lot of this had to be built. So there is this famous uh, notion that, that Lenin actually wanted to kind of start undermining the uh, classical view of family, like the bourgeois family and the traditionalist values. He wanted the Soviet people to be more progressive and it is pretty well established that within the first few years of the establishment of the Soviets a lot of the more traditional institutions have been actually abolished and people were encouraged to you know practice different new types of relationships and like and homosexuality was decriminalized. However, later, in just a few years' time, uh, Lenin and the rest of the Bolsheviks, the rest of the party, they decided to change the course. They decided that it was best to support the self-determination and self-expression of the 
of the minor nations, the non-Russian nations, so they decided that it was more important to make sure that all these nations would have a trusting relationship with Bolsheviks and communists, rather than introduce these new, oftentimes very foreign ideas of, you know, progressive family values and like progressive education and whatnot. So they did not want to escalate those tensions. And of course, again, this is an oversimplification. There is a video that talks a little bit about this that, that was made a couple years ago, and I have mentioned it before. I will put it down below. I think it was pretty well done and I did watch it a long time ago and some comrades actually translated it into Russian, I think, just to show that there are people in the West who actually look into the Soviet history as well. It's not just the local thing that we do. This video does talk about how some of these events took place here in the place where I live in Kazakhstan. But apart from that, this conservatism and this lack of understanding of how trauma works was not a Soviet failing alone. It was not well understood all throughout about, uh, humanity for a long time. Of course, many indigenous people knew about many of these phenomena, but they did not have the science and the tools to investigate it in the way we do nowadays. That is not to say they did not have solutions, but many of these solutions were based on, you know, tradition and traditional practices. And sometimes those uh, practices are still very valid today, like a lot of body work, like somatic work and like movement and just like how to regulate your nervous system. This hasn't really changed for humans because our bodies haven't really changed changed over a pretty long period of time. But nowadays we have more tools to actually investigate why certain practices, indigenous practices included, may work well for the nervous system. And we can synthesize this with, uh, we can synthesize the uh, knowledge of the past with the current modern knowledge, and we can see a bigger, fuller picture and a better understanding of how human psyche works and how we can work with our own nervous systems in order to make the world a better place. Because I firmly believe that a lot of the things could have been avoided if people knew uh, as much about trauma as we do nowadays. Because in the Soviet Union, this war didn't exist. People did not know what developmental trauma was. I think Vygotsky was kind of coming close to the understanding of this. But this was not known for the vast majority of the people at the time. It is still not very well known because we have just started that research. I think we've only made some breakthroughs in trauma study in the last 20 years or so. And if we knew back then what we know now, we would understand that big, big, big changes, um, especially changes like, like the dissolution of empires and establishment of new countries and, you know, very radical, drastic changes, whether they're negative or positive, all of these leave a great imprint on people and they may not adequately adapt due to circumstances because they may not know what's happening within them. They may be like, well, yes, that was bad. I went through civil war. I was born in an empire. I used to be just a peasant working in the fields and now I have access to schools and electricity and all of these books and all of these new thoughts and all of these new theories. It is very scary to a person to go through so many changes and it's very hard for such a person to adapt uh, fruitfully and they may resort to certain coping mechanisms that may not be the healthiest and they may raise their children in accordance with their older values, older beliefs. Yes, they may be able to incorporate newer values into their into the way they uh, raise their children and interact with other people but this is going to take time and if you remember the soviet union didn't even last for a hundred years so that is definitely not enough time to live through all of that trauma all of that intergenerational trauma all of that intergenerational trauma all of that developmental trauma so a lot of traumatized people were raising children who became traumatized who were then integrating all types of knowledge into that trauma and trauma breeds a lot of fear and uncertainty and people who are fearful and uncertain since childhood they may be very very prone to conservatism and the desire to hold on to things that are familiar they may be reluctant to change they may become reluctant to you know newer knowledge they may be reluctant to accept things that they are not familiar with and this is what i think contributes greatly to a lot of the people nowadays in the post-soviet countries turning to conservatism and turning to traditionalism to religion and they seek solace where they can and i absolutely understand that it is scary 
it's heartbreaking it's devastating personally to me to see that uh, parents turn against their children because their children are LGBTQ plus or because their children are not uh, willing to accept their religion it is heartbreaking to me however I understand why it happens and I know that the root of this is capitalism and I know that in such conditions we're not going to be able to see much progress at all most of the progress is going to happen despite of the circumstances not because of them and thinking of all of this makes me pretty sad personally because I do have quite a few people in my life who are turning to traditionalism and who are turning to you know upholding values that are are in opposition to the Soviet values themselves uh, and there are people who are kind of in between who may uphold certain uh, Soviet values and communist values not knowing that they're communist values actually and they may still oppose some other progressive ideas of course there are many other mixes and it makes me feel always like I'm in between because I'm too LGBTQ plus friendly for a lot of more conservative communists. I am too pro-Soviet and Soviet praising for some more progressive, younger leftist people. And I know that there are some contradictions that are not going to go away on their own. I'm willing to continuously educate the people who are in my life. I'm willing to help with whatever I can, but I'm also very tired. So if you are like me and you're very tired in your journey of trying to help all kinds of people in your life, see the truth. and of of course, remembering that you also have to continuously educate yourself because knowledge is never static, the progress is never static, you can never learn everything. Know that I stand in solidarity with you and it's very hard, it's exhausting, but we can do it because there's nothing else we can do and I hope that you have a great day today. Let me know what you think, uh, let me know if my construction of arguments was somewhat understandable today because I know as usual my video is all over the place. But apart from that, I do hope you have a great day today. Consider supporting me on Patreon, do take care of yourself in your community first and I'll talk to you sometime later.